What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this video series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with scholars, policymakers, and journalists involved in the free speech drama unfolding in America. We recently traveled to Capitol Hill to speak with Congressman Phil Rowe, a Republican from Tennessee. Congressman Rowe, uh, welcome to Speaking Freely for the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. Uh, I'm very interested in the bill that you have proposed uh, to uh, do away with free speech zones on college campuses and uh, to promote, in, in, in your terms, to promote free speech on campuses. Could you, could you tell me a little more about that? What you're well, it's a sense of Congress <coughs> that, that we so would... it's a sense of Congress sen resolution. That's correct, sense of Congress resolution. And what really, um, and, and you and I talked off camera before, we were about the same vintage. So you remember the 60s. I do. Uh, most of your students, that will be ancient, <laughs> ancient history. But we that, won't get into that. Well, we'll get into that. But that, that's when I graduated from high school and started college and I grew up in a military town Clarksville Tennessee where the 101st Airborne Division is so many of my friends fathers were in the military at that time we were very very patriotic and obviously this incredible controversy of the Vietnam War uh, was unfolding at that time um, I'm a, a scout, I'm an Eagle Scout, and uh, my scoutmaster was a first sergeant in the 101st Airborne mm -hmm. Division, so we had a very rigid <laughs> scout troop. Uh, he was a father of four, and unfortunately he was killed in 1965 in, the, in Vietnam, Sergeant Thomas E. Thayer. I, I remember him like yesterday. So I saw all of this, um, of this controversy going on and this debate going on in, on the college campus. And I, really wasn't as, as involved in it because I was a uh, biology chemistry uh, major and with a little math thrown in in addition so I was spending a lot of time uh, in the classroom <laughs> trying to get myself in right. medical school but all this was going on it, it, it wasn't ignored and I saw this is where a an incredible debate occurred about a very controversial war and the young people were very much involved in that. Not, not so much older people our age at that time, but very young people because they're the ones, me eventually was drafted in the military. I eventually did go in in 1973, the, one of the last drafted members of the military. So I, I've seen that and I saw the impact it had on the country. And then when I saw many, many decades later as I had a medical practice for many years and then was elected to Congress, came here and saw how this I felt like was being suppressed and I felt like I put a uniform on and left the country to protect that right to uh, free speech. And whether, whether it was speech I agreed with or not, much of the speech that went on the campus I was on, I didn't agree with, but right. people had a right to say it. But um, at the time there were plenty of people who complained about those demonstrations. They did. You said they were unpatriotic, that they were uh, weakening our war effort, that they were... I might have even been one of them. <laughs> One of the people who said that. He said that. I, I may very well have been. I was very, you know, it, disrespecting our flag and those sort of things. We just went against everything I'd been taught as a young man. I had family in essentially every war that sure. this country has ever, ever been involved in. So um, I might have disagreed, but I didn't dis disagree with didn't, their right. But you didn't do. disagree even then no. with, with the right of people to protest against. Nor did I try to obstruct their right to do that. I right. uh, thought it was a good thing. And so how do you compare the circumstances of today with the 60s, with what you remember well, from the 60s? I guess I'm sort of confused by it more than anything. I certainly uh, agree that 
that uh, open free speech between, in other words, you, I have no earthly idea what your political viewpoints are, but I wouldn't shout them down. I would listen to them thoughtfully. Well, actually, and, interestingly, there's no need for us to know each other's political no. point of view. Yours is rather well declared because you're a member of Congress. Congress, that's true. But there's, in order to have a conversation about the issues of the no, day, absolutely. we don't need to know each other's It's points. really irrelevant what they are. And I think, and I always taught my children, I said, look, I don't care what your, what your beliefs are. You're going to work those out as you get to be grown men and women, uh, two boys and a girl. But I said, I want you to be able to defend those intellectually with facts, not just screaming and yelling and, and, uh, and disrupting things. And I, I've, I've uh, noticed we've had town halls after President Trump was elected. I've had uh, live town halls. And they were very different in, in any your district. In my district, and they are very different in any town halls that I'd ever done before. Where you get uh, even during the healthcare debate in 2009 and 10, this was completely different. I had them because I thought it was important that as a representative I'd go back home and and uh, and face my constituents and see what they had to say. But it was very hard to get a word out. And really? It, yeah, it was. They, some they were disrupted. In some cases, we, we, um, I live in a very conservative area. This is northeastern country, Tennessee. Northeastern Tennessee. So it's a very, I mean, Donald Trump got 76% of the vote in my district. So it's a very conservative area. But I, I thought it was important for me to do that for people to exercise their right to have free speech. So we did those uh, town halls, but they were different. Now, how did they differ from Vietnam War era? Protests. I, I don't know that I ever saw a congressman have a town hall during that. <laughs> do, do, do you ever remember one? I don't remember them. I don't either. That became something later. Um, I, I, I've tried to remember back through my representatives that, that I knew who they were, but I don't ever remember them engaging us. Right. Um, right. Sometimes that the, the college would bring in speakers. Um, of course. But it would have, but it would have been, I, I think you would have been tossed. In the little college I went to, Austin P. in Clarksville, Tennessee, which was a very small school at the time, about 1,400 students. And, and once a month, we gathered in the, the gym, the whole entire student body did, and somebody would, it would be, maybe it would be a general or a, a senator or a representative, so we could uh, hear these people, but, but we were expected to sit and listen, not yes. to uh, to and yell disrespectfully. To no, no, no. I think that wouldn't have worked out well or, for us. Or turn your backs. That would not. <laughs> no, have worked that wouldn't out worked well out well. No. <laughs> I know Dean Savage would not. That would not have worked out well right, <laughs> for me. Right. You might have been a former student. I might have been a former student. <laughs> well, uh, it's very interesting to try to translate these principles, and that that uh, as you describe it, ended up working pretty well in the '60s. Whatever position people took, they, yeah. they did, by and large, manage to express themselves and to try to translate those principles to today. Uh, what, do, what do you think is happening today that, that you object to? Well, I think when you, when colleges, which you, you uh, are a professor at one of the great universities of this country, no question about it, Georgetown University, one of the great universities in the United States. And I have no idea what the, the policy is at at Georgetown, but there are many schools out there that are trying to limit where someone can have, even to hand out, and I carry one of these with me, and I didn't, this is not a stage, I, can, I, I stick it in my pocket right. every day when I walk around, so if you want to have a constitution, I've always got one with me. And I, I didn't really do that through my 30-something years of medical practice, I was just busy taking care of patients. But as I got here, I realized how important that document is for our liberty and our freedom. Uh, we, well, we are, of course it is. We are the, the, the shining place in the world where people of different backgrounds and different ethnicities and different beliefs can come together and freely discuss those. And I'm concerned that in some colleges we're limiting that to only one speech or I read a poll, I read a Washington Post article where 20% more men than women, I might add, believed it was okay to use violence to suppress, to suppress speech you didn't agree with. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that, that is very disturbing. It and is. I must say, uh, having been president of a small college and being at Georgetown now, which where free speech really flourishes, I'm skeptical of those results of that survey. I, I hope say. that's, I hope you all, and I hope it's not true. I, I don't know how the data was gathered, but that was very disturbing to me. Right. I, I think <laughs> this notion of, but, but the question um, of, of course, not. I, I don't know anybody who would condone violence to 
as a contribution to a dialogue. But there are some places where people have spoken and often not invited, but they've used the laws very carefully and public institutions and states that don't have any kind of restrictions so that they can just come in and the, the university must rent them a hall if they, if they want. You know, they put the money on the table, they have to be able to rent the hall. And in some cases they are giving speeches that are very offensive to uh, many members of the community, not just some narrow slice of the community, but, but a, a, a lot of people. And so the question that's come up is, well, do the students who are offended by object to this, some of the really quite radical ideology? I'm thinking of people who are, would happily admit that they're white supremacists, that they're racists, that they're anti-Semites, et cetera. And do, the question is whether people have a right to challenge the speech during the speech to try to, uh, a sort, of, <coughs> sort of heckler's veto in a way. You, you know, I, I think that, I mean, that's a good question. You have, you have uh, speech that's so offensive. My, my recommendation is to don't nobody show up <laughs> and, and don't that have, just vote, vote with your feet. Vote with your feet and right. don't, don't show up and hear ridiculous things like right. that. That's what I would do. I mean, I, I'm not forced to go to hear this. If you want to have, well, speak, nobody's forced if you want to have a hall of empty people you want to go speak to, fine, talk yourself to death and then, and then the press has a right to cover it or not cover it. Right. I think a lot of these people, and it's certainly with uh, another thing that's changed, I think, from our generation, uh, is the um, the internet? Uh, oh, I, I see I see so much misinformation. Believe me <laughs> about myself. I sometimes don't recognize myself. Misinformation I, about you. Yes. And where's and, it coming from? Well, it comes. It, there'll be an article about something, and this article will then get embellished and and out on the. I mean, I, there's one right now going around about uh, the the GI Bill. That, that we've already passed, signed into law, it was about a, a, a hearing that never happened. And this, th those are the kinds of things that concern me too because people do look to social media for their information. Sure. And you really need to vet that before Doesn't you... Doesn't that make you yearn for the old days of, of mainstream, old-fashioned journalism where people have to, if they write about a hearing... They actually got to go to they it. They have to been, have been there, they have to have quotes, they have to have... A, a notebook full of quotes from the hearing or a, a tape recorder with them? Well, you and I are still newspaper guys. I mean, I still sit down and read my right. newspaper and, and so forth. But I also admit that, um, that, that I think the Internet's been a, a, a very positive thing for the, for the country and for everyone. Well, I think more people get more information. The question is how much of it is Accurate misinformation. How much of it has not been mediated by the, the time-tested methods of... Oh yeah, to distort or, or to distort uh, the opinion. I mean, I, I read things on my, I get several hundred emails a day, of which most of them are in the trash bin, but right. um, you know, you, you can see where a point of view is being, is leading you to that point. Right. Unless you've studied it carefully, you might be easily led. You could be easily persuaded, that's right. And I think that's what's happened to a lot of people in, especially in tense times and difficult times. So let me ask you this. Uh, you had these town hall meetings where you were protested, I suppose, would be... The, I got a lot of red cards. <laughs> <laughs> would, would be the polite way of putting it. How, how did you handle that when you were protested? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I have been, I am very hard to anger. And I've, I've noticed what a, what that... What a wonderful skill. Yeah, well, I've noticed that it, it, when I was in the operating room all those years I spent there, that yelling at a bleeder didn't make it quit bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> you had to just clamp it calmly and tie it off right. and, and move on with your... Op That's sort of the way I've, I've carried that same so personality sort of nerves trait. nerves of steel. Yeah, I carried that personality trait to here. And First thing you would recommend if you're being protested. Is yeah, it's not get... Don't get... Uh, don't fall into the trap of... Uh, and I'm not talking about being physically assaulted or that sort of thing or no, no, uh, those kinds of things. But um, I listen uh, respectfully to people and then try to answer with the best knowledge and arm yourself with knowledge. That's the thing you need to arm yourself with facts and then back up your uh, beliefs with facts 
And I think that's, that's the best way you can do with any, I would encourage our students that may be watching this is to, don't arm yourself with what somebody else, work it out, look at both sides of the issue. I try to do that when I, I just left a hearing a minute ago on uh, family medical leave. And I tried to listen to both sides. When I left that, leave, uh, that hearing, I thought, gosh, I think it's the first time I've ever agreed with everybody in this, <laughs> this hearing. Well, that's an advantage, I suppose. Are there any people you think, can you think of any people who should not be permitted to speak in, Ooh, in, a, uh, on campuses or in the public sphere? Oh, that's a great question. I, I do know that college presidents, of which you have been, you do have the health, safety, and welfare of your student body. Right. You definitely do, and um, and I, I respect that. You want all students to be safe on your campus. Um, I, I I have a difficult time. I don't know the answer to that question. There may be somebody out there so bad that, but we you can't yell fire in a crowded right. theater. We know that. There's not not all speech is protected. Right. We know that, and the courts have clearly right. defined that. It's not that. absolute. No, because if it if there's incitement to violence. That's correct. That's then, then that is we're not. We're all entitled to object to that speech. That's correct. In, in order to protect public safety. I can tell you that, that uh, college presidents, especially if small, the college I was president of was about the size of the one you attended. Yeah. And presidents of small colleges do a lot of sitting around and saying, what if, you know, what, what is the nightmare scenario? Where, who is the person that I would have to worry about? Who could light not, this place up. Or, yeah. or, you know, that I would have to make this very tough decision of not not allowing that person to speak. And uh, there was a, there's a very interesting case uh, from about 10 years ago, Columbia University in New York. The president was faced with the then president of Iran, who was That's not right. a very popular person in this country, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, yep. and he, he couldn't disinvite him from speaking. Someone had invited him to speak. And so he spent the introduction denouncing him. It, 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 at, at first glance, it looks like a very rude introduction of a speaker um, and then of course many people cheered and then when when the, the president of Iran got up to speak and he denounced the president, president. for having touched him, then people cheered him I don't know whether that solved the problem <laughs> but it did get both sides out by the way. <laughs> well you mean made Mr. Death to America Ahmadinejad yes I know him know his background very well but I, I think that was handled well Right. Uh, he was able to speak, and uh, even though it may have been inflammatory to some people there, he was able to uh, right. have his say. Well, and then people complained that the in introduction was inflammatory. I mean, it, it, it's... But, it, but that's also some, free speech. There are some situations that are difficult. Well, it is also free speech. Yes. And so, so that becomes the question. There's a, there's a speech coming up at the University of Michigan. As, as we talk today, sometime in the near future, there's... A speech coming up at University of Michigan where the president is very upset about the person who, and it's one of these cases where he cannot, he didn't invite the person so he can't disinvite the person. Right. He's going to speak on the campus and he's very worried that it's going to upset people. He's worried about the costs of defending that, that person when he comes, uh, of protecting him, the speaker, even though he's somebody. And, and so there's, there's a situation that's very difficult at colleges and universities now. Let, me, cost of let me go a little deeper. Sure. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a much deeper cost, and that's um, many, many tens of thousands of young men and women who've died to grant that right. Absolutely. So that put a uniform on, leave this country, and help protect those rights. So there is a much higher cost than just writing a check to the local police well, department or sheriff's department right. about that. Well, I'm not arguing, of course, that people shouldn't be permitted to come and speak because it costs too much to protect them. The problem is how do we get to a point in this society, in this political culture, in this university culture, where we don't have these terrible showdowns where people do listen to each other. Maybe your sense of Congress resolution will help. You know, I think uh, we saw that, and, and, and to, to carry out my 60s a little later, I got in medical school, was very happy about that, and uh, I just, uh, I went to medical school in three years and not four. They had an accelerated program, which I wouldn't recommend it, but, but <laughs> anyway, about March of my first year, my freshman year in college, Martin Luther King was assassinated about a mile from where I was in college in Memphis, Tennessee, and I saw the the riots that occurred, um, I saw all of those things occur 
in addition to all of the turmoil that was going on with the Vietnam War, right. uh, uh, where the K Kennedys were assassinated, the, the uh, uh, George Wallace was shot. I mean, it was a very disturbing time, a very, uh, 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 I guess, a decade that was in turmoil, really, a so of social change. If you'll notice, though, there were several decades that were fairly uh, as far as social they changes, seem like simpler times. Much yeah. simpler times, and you're seeing just a little bit of that, but nothing that compared to the '60s. I don't think. Right. So when we say we're in crisis today, I don't, I don't think so. It doesn't compare. To no, the 60s. it does not. And I didn't see cars burning in the street. You saw a little bit of that at, at uh, UCLA. I mean, at uh, USC and uh, University of California. I mean, and at Berkeley, at Berkeley and, um, and and a few other places. But um, not any to the extent that we saw in the 60s. Do you think there's any place where a free speech zone actually might help promote speech rather than restricting it? Where if there's a place you're, you're guaranteed that you can go to say no matter what, like, like the Speaker's Corner in London, in Hyde Park in London, anybody can go there, literally set up a soapbox and say whatever he or she wants. Is that an advantage to a free speech? I, I don't know. I think they're probably, uh, we ought to not decide where that is. I think, I think that free speech zone, especially universities, which are the, the, which are the cradle of ideas in this country. And if not uh, there, then where? If it, if, exactly. If not there, where do you go do this? And you, you can't do it in churches because some of that's restricted by their tax deferred status. You sure. can't do it in other places. Universities are the place to do it. And, and I think respecting someone else's viewpoint, even if it's different from yours. You don't have to like it at all. There's a lot of viewpoints I don't like at all, but I'm not disrespectful to people. Right. I notice that the sponsors of your resolution, and there's some strange bedfellows there. Yeah. Um, Jamie Raskin, Raskin yeah. Congressman from Maryland, Maryland yeah. co-sponsor of your resolution. He would not be thought of as a supporter of President Trump or a no. conservative Republican by any means. How'd, how'd that happen? You know, he, I think uh, Jamie just feels, uh, Congressman Raskin just feels exactly like I do, that, that uh, free speech is, is the rock, is the bedrock of our, of our freedoms in our country. Uh, it really is. When you look at what the, and I become more and more, as I, as I read this little short document, thank goodness, it wasn't, not, not to offend any lawyers out there, but it, you couldn't carry it around in a dump truck if it were written today by lawyers. <laughs> but they wrote... This simple little book that if you'll go back, and I read um, the First Amendment again before this interview, and it, it almost just it's jumps to it. It's pretty quick, and it says all those things are so incredibly important for our country's future and our past. And we really have, have as a nation, we're what we are because of these Ten Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Thank you, Congressman Brown. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure talking. Yes, sir. You also. We've been discussing free speech on college campuses with Congressman Phil Rowe of Tennessee. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.